We're going to read from John chapter 3 today. John chapter 3, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Let's hear what God's Word has to say to us today. John 3, starting at verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. But I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. So this is John the Baptist. He is the last of the prophets. If you go to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, one of the last things that Malachi says in his time as a prophet is from Malachi 4 verse 5. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he wrote that in about somewhere around 400, 450 BC. And then Malachi finished his prophecy. And then there was about 400 years of of silence where there was no prophets. And then finally, John the Baptist comes. And in Matthew 17, 11 through 13, Jesus said, John was the Elijah that was prophesied in Malachi. So he says in Matthew 17, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then uh, the next verse says, Then the disciples understood that he was talking to him about John the Baptist. So he was, John was, the Elijah who was to come. So as Elijah was maybe the quintessential prophet of the Old Testament, John is kind of the one who takes that place just before Jesus comes. So John the Baptist, from the very beginning, John the Baptist was all about who Jesus was. Even in the womb, John the Baptist rejoiced over Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, Mary, the mother of Jesus, goes to see Elizabeth, who is the mother of John the Baptist. And it says in Luke that as soon as Mary's voice was heard, John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb. And Elizabeth said, when I heard your voice, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. So even from the womb, John the Baptist was delighted in and was rejoicing over Jesus and who he was and what he meant. As an adult, John the Baptist preached an urgent need to repent. He was 
he was not a guy to mince his words. He laid it all out there. It was kind of harsh, actually, if you read some of the things that, that he said. He basically says, you, you got to repent or you're going to hell. And there's no other way around it. He put it straight out there. In Matthew it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he was kind of a weird guy. He would probably not be the most pleasant person to be around, and he probably would not be somebody who you'd want to spend a lot of time with. He was just kind of strange. He lived in the desert like a monk, and some thought he was possessed. He was, he was weird. Jesus said of him in Luke 7, John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. People actually thought he was demon-possessed because he was just so out there and strange. He didn't eat, he didn't drink, it says he ate grasshoppers and wild honey. He gave a baptism of repentance. It was not like the baptism that we celebrate today, that's the baptism of Christ, but John gave a baptism of repentance, and that's why they called him the Baptist. And then John's ministry comes to a point where he encounters Jesus. Jesus is baptized. And then Jesus goes on his way and starts his ministry. But John still has some followers of his own. And that's where this passage is. In verse 26, John's followers are now disappointed that Jesus is more popular. So they say to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. He's he's more popular than us now. They seem to be disappointed about that. Maybe, Maybe it's just that human element of jealousy in there. Everybody's going to him now. So John sets them straight. We're not to be jealous of him. Not at all. In verse 28, John had a mission to point people to Jesus. That was his mission. There's there's somebody coming, the sandals of whom I am not even worthy to untie. He's coming. You yourselves, he says in verse 28, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The reason why I'm here is so that I would point ahead to him and steer you to him. Not that I would get all the attention and acclaim and the followers, but that you would follow him, that you would notice him. John cared so much about his mission that he was not swayed by human opinion or attention. He didn't care that Jesus was getting all the followers now, that all the attention was going over there. That didn't bother him. He didn't care that people thought of him as demon-possessed. He kept on doing what he was doing. He was on a mission. He even said to to the king at that time, King Herod, that it's not lawful for you to have the wife you have. Because Herod the king had uh, married his brother's wife. He said right to his face, it's not lawful for you to have her. So John is basically saying to his disciples, you know what, I'm glad that everybody's going to this, this man, Jesus, because he's the Christ. They should be going to him. And then he gives this analogy of, of a bride and bridegroom. And a best man. So the bride, in his analogy, is God's people. God's people are the bride, and this is this is a this is something that's picked up in the rest of Scripture too. The best man in this scenario is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is like uh, the best man in this this wedding. 
And then the bridegroom would be Jesus. So John the Baptist is saying, I'm not the groom. I'm the best man. I want God's people for the groom, like a best man does. So I've, I've, had, um, I've had two opportunities to be a, a best man. One time was um, for my brother-in-law and my sister, and the other time was for my, my cousin, who's kind of like a, a brother to me. And both of those times, I did not want the bride for myself, especially not in the case of my sister. I mean, you're a best man. You want the bride and the groom to be together. And you're there to oversee that and sign your name to it and to stand up there and to proudly witness it. And so you're glad that, they come, that they're coming together. You're glad that they're being married. That's what John's saying. I don't want the bride for myself. That's not what this is about here. I'm the best man. I'm not the groom. It's in human nature, all of us, to want recognition, to want acclaim, to want praise, maybe attention, respect, and admiration. That's, that's within all of us, and that's what John's disciples were kind of getting at. But prophets are always second. Prophets are always second. They're always second to God. They're second to His message and the need for that message to go out. Prophets, there's this expression that you could say, prophets are always the bridesmaid, never the bride. They're always the bridesmaid. Now, historically, that expression is something that means, you know, you're not able to live up to your full potential. You're always the bridesmaid and never the bride. So it's kind of, you know, the way that people use it is kind of in a sad way or a disappointing way. But when you use it in the sense of prophets, it's not sad or disappointing at all. In Christ, our full potential is to be a bridesmaid to Christ and the church. That's our full potential. That is the best thing that we can be. To be the bridesmaid at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, I feel a divine jealousy for you, For I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And then there's a verse in Isaiah that Paul takes up in Galatians 4 also. But it says, Sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. In, in the Lord, it's, it's different. The, the hopes and dreams that we might have, they change. Back then, if, especially if you were a woman, your, your life's goal was to, to marry and to have children and to continue on the family and the species, for that matter. That was your goal. But here, it says, you are blessed if you have no children at all. When you say always a bridesmaid, never a bride, when it comes to the prophets, it's a little different. And then John says this really cool phrase that people quote sometimes too. Verse 30, he must increase but I must decrease. And this is godliness. Godliness is to humble yourself and exalt the Lord. That's what it means to be godly. 
And notice how it's worded there. He must increase. I must decrease. It doesn't say it's advisable that I must decrease and he must increase. It's not a good thing. It's a must. It's necessary that he increase and I decrease. And in the Gospel of John, that word is kind of code for God's will. For what God ordains. So in the rest of John, it says, you must be born again. It says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. Or that the scripture says, he must rise from the dead. This is what God ordains. This is what God calls us to. Jesus must increase, we must decrease. So, John had a mission to point people to Jesus, to have him increase and he decrease. We have a mission to point people to Jesus too. That's our mission. Our goal is not to make ourselves great, to not achieve our own goals. Our mission is to point people to Jesus. Our goal is not to be the bride or the groom, but to be the bridesmaid or the best man. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We're the ambassadors. We are a people for his own possession, it says in 1 Peter, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we're here for. This is our mission. In verses 31 through 34 in what we read, it says basically that Jesus is from heaven and knows heavenly truth. So all of us, we're from, we're from the earth. We were, we were born here and we live here. Jesus, he was preexistent. He was in heaven before he was on earth. He knows what heaven's like. He's had eternal fellowship with God the Father himself. And he became one of us and lived among us. But he's not from here. He's from above. We're from down here, he's from up there. So when he talks, we should listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. He's got that heavenly view that we don't have. He knows what it looks like from up there. He knows what it's like to have eternal fellowship with God. He knows how God thinks and how his heart beats, what he wants, his hopes and dreams and all that. So when he talks, we should listen to him. Don't, John says, don't listen to me. I'm from the earth just like you, but let's listen to him because he knows what he's talking about. Prophets bring God's messages to mortals. So God is in heaven, we are on earth. Priests, their focus is on what we lift up to the Lord. All of the sacrifices and, and festivals and how we worship the Lord. Kings are leaders among us that organize us in the ways that we need to be and protect us and everything. And prophets go from God to us. They're relaying God's messages to us. This is what the Lord says is often in the prophets. This is not what I'm saying. This is what God says. This is God's communication to us. All the prophets from Elijah to John the Baptist are from the earth. And all prophets before would relay God's messages secondhand. Here's what God says. But now that Jesus has come, we have God's messages firsthand. From God himself. Jesus is the Son of God from heaven who he himself now says this is what I say. So a lot of times Jesus would say, you've heard that it was said before, but I'm telling you this. Jesus spoke with that heavenly authority. 
John is saying Jesus is from heaven itself, so he is the prophet to end all prophets. He's the one. Let's listen to him. All the messages that he has to bring come from God himself, from heaven itself, not secondhand like me and the rest of the prophets who came before me. Isaiah 54, verse 13, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In other words, in the future, someday, Isaiah says, when Jesus comes, all of your children will then be taught by the Lord himself. It won't be secondhand anymore. It'll be firsthand. Let's look at the screen and let's respond to this together. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. Jesus is prophet and priest and king, and he is the one to end all prophets, priests, and kings. So John the Baptist was the last of the prophets. And because of John the Baptist, many believed in Jesus, it says. Many believed. In John 10, 40-42, it says, He went away again, that's Jesus, across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. Jesus is going to where John had been ministering and baptizing. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in Jesus there. So John was the bridegroom or the bride's, or the, excuse me, John was the best man or the maid of honor, the bridesmaid. And many came to Jesus because of him. And when you even look into the book of Acts, there's people who had known about John and heard about John and his teachings and even gone, undergone John's baptism, but they hadn't heard of Jesus yet. But when they did hear of Jesus, they believed John paved the way. The greatest that you and I can be, the the best thing that we could possibly be, is someone who leads others to believe in Jesus. That is our mission. That is our ultimate goal in life. If you are a failure at everything else in your life, but you got this, then you are a success. Everything else is secondary to this. And when you care so much about the mission, you're not swayed by what other people think or whether you're getting the attention or not. Because Jesus is the greatest thing. Jesus is the only way to the only God. He is the only hope in a hopeless world. He is the only joy that withstands all sorrow. He is the only meaning in this rat race of life. He is the only truth in a world of opinions. He is the one who is from heaven. Let's point people to him. Let's get people to believe in him. As prophets who share in the anointing of Christ, always be the bridesmaid to the bride of the Lamb. Let's not seek to be the best. Let's not seek to be the one with the most attention, the most glory, the most praise. Let's seek to be the one who ushers people in to believing in Jesus Christ, who is the greatest person to ever walk this earth because he came from heaven. Let's point people to him like John did.
And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, our God in heaven, we praise you for sending Jesus Christ so that we can know you as you are truly known, can have knowledge of you firsthand. Lord, we pray that we would take our mission to heart, that we would point more people to Jesus, to who he is and what he means for us so that more people would believe. And Lord, even if other people criticize us or think less of us because of that, help us to be so focused on our mission that we don't care. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.